Good evening, I'm Janella Massa. Andrew and Adrian are away. Tonight, COVID forces the world juniors off the ice. We came up against an opponent that was not on the ice. Omicron bursts the hockey bubble as cases hit record levels in Canada and around the world. What to do about back to school? I don't know if I'm going to have to take next week off. I'm furious. BC delays class. Newfoundland goes online and other families stuck in limbo. Guilty. Ghislaine Maxwell is convicted of helping Jeffrey Epstein lure and sexually abuse underage girls. From a backyard ski slope to a hospital's brief reprieve from COVID to sharing gold. People were ready to experience joy. The moments that moved you in 2021 and our favorites too. This is The National. One by one today, around the world and across Canada, old COVID-19 case records were shattered when new infection numbers rolled in. In some countries, they were tens of thousands of cases higher than just the day before. In Canada, new records were set in nine provinces and territories driven by Omicron. Quebec once again topping the list with over 13,000 cases. And Ontario not far behind. BC and Alberta also posting new highs in the thousands. And through schools and sports today, we're seeing some of the consequences. It was just days ago when some of the world's best young hockey players took to the ice in Alberta for the World Juniors. Today, they were pulled off for good. The rest of the tournament canceled because of COVID. Carolyn Dunn with a reaction. No trophy, no celebration. This was how the World Juniors ended. We've done the very best we can. We came up against an opponent that was not on the ice, but that was bigger than all of us. And we gratefully, we've had to cancel this event. The virus proved too much, first infecting the U.S. team, which was forced to forfeit to Switzerland. Then today, positive tests from the former Czech Republic, Czechia. And then Russia. The writing was on the wall. I suspect that as long as we have Omicron circulating at high levels in many communities and in fact many countries that this would pose similar risk to other uh, sporting events as well. The IIHF is under scrutiny for whether its protocols established before Omicron were strict enough to keep officials and players safe. Teams quarantined for two days upon arriving in Alberta, and then they were tested daily. Players not supposed to mingle with the public, confined to the hotel and rink. Certainly, the end result is a blow to the athletes who have worked years to get to this elite level of play. And of course, for COVID-weary fans. It's just the average fan who's just sitting at home saying, wow, I really wanted to watch a game tonight, and I can't even do that. For Team Canada, a real contender to reclaim the championship, that chance is over for now, but perhaps not forever. IIHF officials say they're looking for any possibility to come back this year. We're going to take uh, the next month to think about it and maybe come with a good surprise. And after a year and a half of bad surprises, that is a welcome prospect. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Meanwhile, the prospect of going back to school in this latest COVID wave has parents anxious. Today, BC and Newfoundland announcing plans to delay in-person learning, but Ontario still hasn't said anything yet. And as Deanna Sumanak johnson shows us, the uncertainty just days from the end of the break is leading to frustration. I'm furious. Five days ahead of the scheduled return to school, with Omicron spreading through Ontario, Yona Nestel still doesn't know if her two kids, aged five and eight, are going back to class. I don't know if I'm going to have to take next week off. I don't know if my kids are going to be in school. If not, if I have to get devices. Uh, I mean, this takes like weeks to prepare for. Nestel would like to see a return delayed by a few weeks, something many other provinces have already announced. In Newfoundland and Labrador... Classes will start on January 4th as scheduled, but in an online learning or virtual format. And in BC, return to school for most kids will be pushed back by a week. Taking a few extra days now for planning and preparation 
By doing so, we are setting up our schools for the best possible start. Quebec and Nova Scotia are extending their holiday breaks too. In Ontario, frustration and anxiety are growing with no clear direction from the province. But experts are divided on what that decision should be. An open letter signed by over 500 deeply concerned doctors urged the Ford government to make a commitment to keeping schools open. I think that we know very well uh, the harms of school closures and we've seen, we've seen the harms mount over the past two years and the harms of closures far outweigh um, any perceived benefit of keeping kids at home. But other experts say that Omicron changes that equation. I think Ontario should keep schools closed for at least a couple of weeks in January. His concern that increased transmission, especially among unvaccinated kids, will lead to increased hospitalization. When um, these doctors are writing these, uh, these letters, they're talking solely about the experience of kids at the individual level and they're failing to see the population dynamic. If the system collapses, what are you going to do? <laughs> That's not good for anybody's mental health. So, Deanna, what would experts like to see happen before kids return to schools? Janelle, our rapid tests are a huge part of that equation. We know that all Ontario school children were sent home with a few of them before the holidays, but now those tests are next to impossible to find. And yet experts agree they're one of the most effective ways of keeping our schools safer in the face of Omicron. Test, test, test. Another thing that keeps on coming up are N95 style masks, another item that's really expensive, tricky to get, and yet we know that they provide much better protection against the Omicron variant than the traditional blue surgical masks. So experts also say those should be made available definitely to educators and maybe to some students too. Janella. All right, we'll see if either of those things happen. Deanna Sumanak Johnson in Toronto. Thanks. Well, it's not just rapid tests that are hard to find and not just for students. As Marina von Stackelberg shows us, getting any test at all is a challenge in parts of this country and it's raising concerns about inequity. Another day, another lineup for COVID-19 tests. I think it's kind of crazy. I feel like it should probably be a little bit more accessible. Both rapid antigen tests, the ones you take home to swab yourself, and PCRs, the ones confirmed in a lab, are hard to come by in large parts of the country. This is the website I ordered from. I don't know if it's legitimate. It says it is. Spencer McCall bought her rapid tests online. Like a lot of Canadians, the Sudbury mom can't track down any in her city. I feel like it's almost like a luxury item right now, right? Between that and getting the uh, KN95 masks. Um, if you find them, if you can afford to buy them, uh, if you know someone. Some private clinics are offering quick turnaround PCR tests, if you can pay $180. Manitoba's wait time for a free PCR swab has stretched up to a week. So the province has cut a deal with a private lab to handle an extra 1,000 tests a day. Meanwhile, a grocery store in Winnipeg is selling individual rapid tests in Ziploc bags for $40 a pop. Not only is it inequitable, it's also really inefficient. This expert says a patchwork of testing will hurt marginalized communities the most. There are people who are at real risks in terms of going into work, taking on high-risk occupations, being around high-risk individuals not having access to these tests. Many of those people can't just buy a test or wait in line. The mailbox would have been the easiest way. Everyone's got a mailbox, but you know, the, the older crowd, they can't stand out line like uh, the younger crowds can. It's not just inequities. A lack of proper testing can also contribute to inaccuracies in case counts too. BC has reported nearly 3,000 new infections. But Chief Public Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry says the real number is likely three or four times that. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Toronto. Nunavut extended its territory-wide lockdown to January 17th today after COVID cases more than doubled overnight. With active cases in eight communities, we are approaching a breaking point in terms of our health care capacity. The territory reporting 37 new cases today, the highest single day count so far. Officials say remote communities are not equipped to handle outbreaks. And with only one hospital in Iqaluit, resources are fading fast. The Premier is now asking the federal government for help, especially with housing, so that people can isolate safely.
In some provinces, there's growing frustration and anxiety over the wait for booster shots. While many are allowing anyone over 18 to get a third dose, others like BC are taking a more gradual approach. Renee Filipponi shows us how that's got some people on edge. It's a daily routine for Cynthia Hadley, checking her phone to see if she can book her booster dose. There's this Omicron variant going around and everybody's telling us, get your booster, get your booster, get your booster. Well, I'd like to. <laughs> the 60 year old is not yet eligible for a third dose in BC and is frustrated things are taking so long. I thought I was going to get my invite when I was six months from my second booster and I've turned on the news and all I see is 18 year olds in Ontario complaining that they can't get their booster after three months. And I'm like, why? You know, why are we being treated like this in BC? You know, in Alberta, I would have had my shot already. In Manitoba, I would have had my shot already. Unlike in Ontario, there is only one central vaccine booking site, and you need an invite from the province to do it. Right now, only people over 61 and those at risk of severe illness can get a booster. 20% of all adults in BC have received it so far, lower than many other provinces. More and more people will be um, invited to, uh, to book their boosters and more and more pharmacies and larger clinics are coming online in the next couple of weeks so we can move that, uh, that up for more and more people. But some want the eligibility broadened, including Megan Mason, who is pregnant. There's a lot of unknowns for us. Um, you know, obviously nobody wants to get COVID. Um, but for a pregnant person, you know, we're trying to protect ourselves. We're trying to protect our unborn child. In downtown Vancouver, the line for COVID testing wraps around the block with people waiting hours in the cold. We're a household of five and uh, we had Christmas Eve dinner with one other family who ended up testing positive. For some now worried they have COVID, the boosters can't come quick enough. As soon as it's available, I'd be glad to get it, but there's no real confirmation on when that's going to happen. The province is promising appointments will be available for everyone starting next month. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. The World Health Organization today called Omicron and Delta twin threats that together are driving infection counts to record highs. Worldwide cases are up 11% in just a week. The U.S., Australia and a string of European countries broke records today. Farmer Ali has the details and the warning from the WHO. Large crowds relax on the steps outside the Sacre Coeur Basilica in Paris on a day when the country shattered a record for new COVID-19 infections. The French health minister says the number of cases is dizzying. In the past 24 hours, 208,000 people have been added to the count. He says calculations show that every second of every day, more than two people test positive. Greece hit record highs too today. So did Portugal and Italy, despite earlier successes with high vaccine uptake and a COVID pass. And closer to home, the U.S. hit a record daily case average of more than 262,000 infections. I'm highly concerned that Omicron being more transmissible, circulating at the same time as Delta, is leading to a tsunami of cases. The World Health Organization is now sounding the alarm on the global rise in new infections and the potential strain on health services. We don't want people to be complacent, saying this is not severe, this is, is mild, and we have to be very careful in that uh, narrative. Was that your booster then? A narrative the UK Prime Minister says there's evidence for. We've got a lot of cases of, of Omicron, uh, but on the other hand, we can see the data about the relative mildness of Omicron, and what we can also see is the, the very, very clear effect of getting those jabs. Unlike many European countries, England has elected not to announce any new restrictions until the new year, to mixed reviews. I think it's kind of irresponsible, um, and I do believe it's down to politics, not the safety of the public. I think uh, too many more restrictions could be detrimental to, to the wider population. Today, the World Health Organization once again called for a more equitable distribution of vaccines. It says the emphasis on boosters in wealthy countries could lead to shortages again. Its goal to reach 70% vaccine coverage in every country by next year. Farah Morali, CBC News, London. 
To some other news now, a long-awaited verdict today in a high-profile trial in New York. British socialite Ghislaine Maxwell was convicted of helping the late financier Je Jeffrey Epstein sexually abuse teenage girls. As Travis Danrash explains, it caps a saga full of disturbing details dating back years. She was once part of New York City and London's social elite, partner to an American millionaire. Now, Ghislaine Maxwell faces up to 65 years in prison. A jury found the six-year-old guilty on five of six counts related to sex crimes against minors, including sex trafficking. In court, Maxwell showed no reaction when the verdict was read. Outside, no reaction from her family as they left. We firmly believe in Ghislaine's innocence. Obviously, we are very disappointed with the verdict. We have already started working on the appeal, and we are confident that she will be vindicated. I want to commend the bravery of the girls, now grown women, who stepped out of the shadows and into the courtroom. The testimony during the month-long trial was often disturbing and sexually graphic. Victims recounting abuse and grooming at the hands of Maxwell and Epstein at the financier's multiple mansions. Maxwell often sent to find young girls who could recruit others. She has had 60 years of freedom to walk free on this earth. May she never have another day of freedom as long as she lives. Trial lawyer Lisa Bloom, who has represented eight of Epstein's victims, said she was moved to tears by the verdict. She was enticing girls to come over and spend time with Jeffrey Epstein. She was teaching them how to massage him. She was normalizing the sexual behavior and even participating in it at times. It's vile stuff and it's very damaging to the many, many victims. Maxwell never took the stand in her own defense. Her lawyers argued she was being used as a scapegoat because prosecutors were unable to try Epstein, who killed himself in jail in 2019. No date has been set for Ghislaine Maxwell's sentencing. Travis Stanrash, CBC News, Washington. The Chinese government is continuing its crackdown on pro-democracy media in Hong Kong, with a Canadian activist arrested. There is a Canadian and she is in custody right now. We don't know um, about her well-being. Up next, why some say it's time for the government to intervene. Plus... Even with infections soaring, some are seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Could Omicron be the beginning of the end? Our panel of doctors will give us their take. And a little later. In a difficult year, we wanted to remember the moments that lifted us up. Our top 10 moments of 2021 coming up. We're back in two. Chants of shame rang out in Moscow today after another prominent human rights group was shut down. A Moscow city court ordered the Memorial Human Rights Center to close just a day after its sister organization, Memorial International, had its legal status revoked. Both groups say the orders are politically motivated and are part of a wider crackdown on opposition voices. In Hong Kong, a Canadian is under arrest after a crackdown on critics. Singer and activist Denise Ho was among those swept up in a raid targeting one of the territory's last major pro-democracy media outlets. Sarah Levitt has a look at the outrage it's generated. She's a pop star, an outspoken pro-democracy advocate in Hong Kong, and a Canadian citizen. But Denise Ho is now under arrest in Hong Kong. We need the Canadian government to intervene. There is a Canadian and she is in custody right now. Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Joly calls the arrest deeply concerning, writing our consular officials are engaged and stand ready to provide assistance on the ground. We are monitoring the situation very closely. We are not talking to reporter. We are not talking to the, the, the media. Hong Kong police say seven people were arrested, all connected to the online pro-democracy media outlet Stand News. Ho used to sit on the company's board. Her political awakening began as she gained fame. She came out as gay in 2012, rare for a celebrity in Hong Kong. Then she became an outspoken participant in the 2014 Hong Kong pro-democracy movement. 
She was arrested, and China banned her from performing on the mainland. Undeterred, she continued her activism at the 2019 protests in Hong Kong, where she credited growing up in Montreal as a source of inspiration. For me, Canada is, you know, another home. So uh, I think what I have learned there, I am applying it right now here in Hong Kong. Ho's latest arrest for sedition was made under a colonial-era law, but the search of her home and Stan News office came under a new national security law imposed by Beijing last year following the protests. So I'm really uh, worried about her. Sunny Chung protested alongside Ho. He's been living in the United States since fleeing Hong Kong last year. Her arrest really uh, demonstrated that Hong Kong's autonomy, press freedom, freedom of speech, this kind of uh, very important values are no longer being cherished. Values Ho has always fought for. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. When we come back, we return to our top story with case numbers breaking a records around the world. It's hard to see any light at the end of the tunnel. Coming up, our panel of doctors tackle a topic on everyone's mind, what Omicron could mean for the future of the pandemic. Plus, for most people, uh, flood, uh, heat and uh, freezing rain, those are going to be some of the key impacts. Adapting to our changing planet, what Canadians can do to prepare for more extreme weather. We've been saying this for a very long time, the acute phase of the pandemic, the pandemic uh, that's been associated with the tragedy of deaths and hospitalizations, that can end in 2022. And we hope that that is the, the end game here. That was the WHO's emergencies program director with maybe a glimpse of a light at the end of a long pandemic. If the acute phase of the pandemic ends in 22, then what comes next? And could Omicron be the turning point? Let's bring in two infectious disease specialists, Drs. Zane Chagla and Dr. Suman Chakrabarty. Hi to both of you. Thanks for being with us tonight. Dr. Chakrabarty, I'll start with you. Omicron feels a bit different than the variants that came before. Is this the beginning of the end? Can we be a little bit optimistic as we head into this new year? Well, you know, as you guys know, I'm, a, I'm an optimist by nature, but I am very cautiously optimistic about uh, Omicron. You know, when it came on the scene, you know, its remarkable ability to be able to spread so quickly to so many people, you know, uh, was, was important to look at. And it really brings along with it immunity, and that's our key out of the pandemic. And I think the degree of immunity that can be uh, obtained by being exposed to Omicron for so many people, I think, is going to really change the way it uh, transmits in the community to a more stable, low level. So I do think this could be the start of that. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, but let's see what happens. I suspect this is going to start in early 2022. Dr. Chagla, we keep hearing the term endemic phase. What does that actually mean? Yeah, so, you know, an endemic is where you have stable transmission within a geographical region uh, that, you know, is within some sort of containment or some sort of barrier for which, you know, we expect certain rates. Uh, you know, so we have stable transmissions of influenza. We have stable transmissions of other respiratory viruses. We see a little bit of variation year to year. It's not necessarily a straight line. People get infected more in the winter than the summer, but they fall within a range of what we think is normal. And so, you know, this is where we will likely end up with COVID-19. There are going to be infections every year. They'll fall likely more in the winter than the summer. Um, but they won't see these explosive growth rates. They'll see, you know, a, a contained range, particularly in the healthcare system. Okay, Dr. Chakrabarty, uh, we've been reporting on case counts for almost two years, but at this point in the pandemic, is that the metric we should be paying attention to? You know, this has been a source of frustration for me that uh, we uh, have so much stock in the case count. Uh, and I think that as time has gone on, this has become much less and less informative, especially now that it has uncoupled largely with the most important metrics for me, which is hospitalizations, and more specifically, people who are hospitalized for COVID as opposed to with COVID. And uh, within this count is also those who are in ICU. I think looking at these metrics is going to be much more uh, uh, informative of what the true issue is, the true uh, strain is on our healthcare system, because that's really what's been under fire for the past two years. So I think that while the case count does give some information, it's much less informative than hospitalizations and, and ICU thing. And that's exactly what I've been looking at. 
Dr. Chagla, inevitably there will be another variant after Omicron. Can we expect it to be even milder or is it possible that we end up going in the other direction? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's lots of lineages where this virus can spread and, and change, whether it's the Delta lineage, whether it's the Omicron lineage, whether it's some other lineage we don't even know of yet. What I will say, though, is, is what Dr. Chakrabarti has mentioned is immunity is going to give us some protection, right? And, and the fact that many of our populations are getting vaccinated, we do need to do a better job in some places in the world. The fact that, unfortunately, Omicron is going to affect a lot of people, but that immunity that comes from Omicron is also going to reinforce that immunity, uh, is going to give us a very different uh, uh, ability to react to a new variant. And again, it will be a very, very high bar to pass for a variant to be much more severe to be able to pass through that many layers of immunity. Okay, Dr. Chakrabarty, the last and very big question, of course, not a lot of time to answer it. When can we know if this pandemic is officially over? And I know you don't have a crystal ball, but how soon could that be? Yeah, it's tough, but long and short of it, it's going to be a combination of metrics like we talked about, case rates, etc., but also a sociolytical profile where we look at uh, getting uh, lifting of mandates and uh, not having uh, capacity limits. All of these things together will mark the end of the pandemic. It's not going to be a single day or a single week, but something that gradually happens over time, though I do suspect that this is hopefully going to happen at some point in uh, early 2022. Dr. Zain Chagla, Dr. Suman Chakrabarti, both infectious disease specialists. Thanks so much for your insights tonight. Thanks, All the best. Well, in a year with a lot of difficult news, they were the little moments that brought so much joy. Just try to lift people's spirits up. Coming up, ordinary Canadians with extraordinary moments, our top 10 of 2021. Well, the news has been filled with so many difficult stories this year. Sometimes you just need a little moment of levity, of kindness, a moment that makes you smile or feel connected. That's why we do the moment every night here on The National. We all have our favorites, and so do you. From your views, likes, comments, and shares, here are your top moments of the year. Those acts of kindness, big and small, are our moment. That's our moment. That's our moment. It's going to be a lot different for you now, hey? Um, be brave. Don't be such a chicken squad. Legends are made every day. Hey, you guys, can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you, yeah. Hello. Hello. How are you? Nice. I guess, is this our Christmas party, I guess? <laughs> Well, I'll go get the eggnog then. Okay. <laughs> the purpose of the moment. I feel like everyone has a different sense of, of what the moment is there for. I mean, to me, it's just always been this really nice, humbling reminder of our humanity. I don't know, all these, these wonderful, little, marvelous, sparkly, connective bits of tissue that make life, life. Park family, and last year we built a tow rope and a ski hill in our very own backyard. Usually the joy in tobogganing is going down the hill, and now the joy in tobogganing is going up the hill. This Calgary family's pandemic project to build their own tow rope put the rest of us to shame. Theirs became the backyard to hang out in. We were actually quite amazed at the response. We weren't expecting it at all. Yeah, it was fun for us to hear from people from all over the world. Um, a lot of people commenting on how Canadian it is. The Toronto couple behind this good idea were also relatively desperate for a good time this past year. We saw it as a, a way to just get out and enjoy ourselves, have a little fun and do it while not breaking any rules. Your pick for number nine goes to the ingenuity of Jacob Leo and Lotta Van Gelderen to find a way to dine out when we couldn't dine in. We had a lot of people reaching out, friends, family. You're in the news. Fun to put a smile on people's faces during a time when we couldn't really get out and do much. No egg is the same. Everyone is unique. You surprised us with how quickly and enthusiastically you liked and shared Pasanka artist Kathy Wright's passion for her Ukrainian culture. 
Many of you sharing your own stories about creating the intricate eggs with your family or passing on the tradition to others. My great aunt taught me. She was taught by her mother before and her mother before that. Wright says her phone blew up after her moment on the moment. I think what surprised me the most was just how many people reached out, commented, direct messaged, and I've already started creating my collection for Easter 2022. Number seven, a moment in the cold got very hot very fast. There's some aggressive ones, there's friendly ones, there's cuddly ones, there's mama bears, baby bears. I had honks, I had uh, thumbs up, people waving. It puts a smile on somebody else's face, so I just kept on going. Winnipeg's Venora Bennett was apparently onto something, and this is where we started noticing a pattern in the moments you liked. So many stuck at home, connecting with those who found ways to bring a little joy. Venora, it's Adrian. How are you? Good. I'm waiting for it to snow. I had some people in the community come around and ask me about the snow bears again this year. It's just really nice to, to put a smile on somebody's face. I think we all have gifts that we can use to, to cheer everybody up around us. An angel by her side all, all the times I knew we couldn't call Speaking of gifts, Elaj Balde's stunning skate on a frozen Alberta lake last winter had Canada and the world collectively saying, wow. Oh! The first time I saw um, a black skater skating in front of me, Maxime Billy-Fortin from here, from Quebec, um, and it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. It, it shifted my perspective on what figure skating could look like. I know it's not the top 10 stories of the year, but it's our top 10 moment and you're up there. And I, I wonder what, what does that tell you about Canada right now? People were wanting to see something different. People were ready to experience joy. People were ready to, to see figure skating in a way that hasn't been done before. For me on a personal level, to me, it kind of reflects what my year has been like, you know, it started with this, you know, shooting a video out of nowhere and then posting it, the video going viral and then my, my life completely changing. And so making it into the top 10 means a lot to me. And um, yeah, I think it's really special. This is Jeopardy! For us, this moment was always intended to be about a moment in time that needed a closer look, that tells us a bit of who we are. So when this country lost its great Canadian son in Alex Trebek, the moment clearly belonged to him. The day his final shows aired, we left the last word to him. Once before I go, I want you to know. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for spending the time with us. We'll see you again next week. Number four, what a shift in mood and what joy in your choice. A thousand doses, I felt that something a bit bigger needed to happen. You know, we thought, let's up the ante a little. Canada was so ready to celebrate alongside this small Toronto pharmacy when they hit the first big vaccine milestone. That excitement might feel a lifetime ago now, but that was the beginning of getting us out of this. We just try to lift people's spirits up. And we hope to continue to do this. Look for our 5,000 no celebration. It should be good. It took us five tries to finally to get them to actually move. And number three, which is pretty striking because it wasn't that long ago. But here's the thing. Kindness in the face of loss is a Canadian hallmark. You do it and you salute it always. So when young men rushed to save animals from the BC floodwaters, it meant a lot. We went around them with our boat. Once the, the first one started swimming, then the rest just followed. They had to swim maybe 10 feet and then they were on shallow ground again. I had a lump in my throat the whole time, so I was my emotions were pretty high. And I own horses myself, so they're kind of like my kids. Today I'm emotional that it's been 15 months and today is the first day COVID free. 
If only your number two choice was the last word on COVID. It was mid-June and the Toronto General Hospital was celebrating. Pick up. Walk through and pick up your booster juice. <laughs> we can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. They could see the end of the tunnel and we will again. That you all wanted it to be so speaks to what this year has taken from us. And so. Maybe what you saw in your number one choice is the best of humanity at what can feel like the hardest of times. Can we have two gold? It's possible. It, it, it depends if you decide, History, if you go decide on the champion. <laughs> two competitors deciding to share the Olympic gold medal in high jump. Who does that? Sharing the glory, the hugs, the unbridled happiness. All of it seeming to make the moment a bit of a wish list. You chose wisely, Canada. Your moments are our moment tonight. One of the things about this feature on the National is that it's also a moment in time. It's just a reminder of all the things that, that we've been through as a country, right? You know how in bookstores there is the bestsellers and then there are the staff picks? Um, <laughs> well, my staff pick actually is, does include a book. This is uh, Suzanne oh. Samard, who is a UBC forestry professor. I started getting all these emails and texts. Did you know you're on Ted Lasso? And I'm like, who's Ted Lasso? <laughs> And there's this scene where one of the coaches on that program quotes uh, a person talking about uh, trees in a forest. We used to believe that trees competed with each other for light. Suzanne Samard's field were challenged that perception that we now realize that the forest is a socialist community. So we did it as a moment. And the reaction I know personally that I got on Twitter from people who were just so, like, first of all, she has a huge fan base. I didn't realize that. How many you, uh, forestry professors do? Um, and the fact that she was celebrated on uh, Ted Lasso. And Amy Adams is going to play Suzanne Samard in a Come movie. On. At least. I just can't stop thinking about that, that poor woman in Dartmouth, Betty, I think her name was, who ordered like a bajillion toasters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I had ordered two toasters, when my two toasters showed up, it was 222 toasters. It was a bit of a shock. Then I called our supplier and they said they couldn't take them back. She posted on social media, as, as one might reasonably do, saying, hey, I've got a bunch of toasters. I'll even slash the price for you. And there was people waiting at the door at 9 a.m. to buy toasters. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and they just, like a train all day long, coming and going, coming and going for toasters. She sold out in no time because mm -hmm. not only did people look at this poor situation, this poor woman, and think, I've got to help her out. They bought them so that they could donate them to other people and just spread spread the love so the moment the moment that i would choose is frankie one two three four you know little frankie whalen in north vancouver <laughs> yes who fell fast and hard for the bagpiper halfway through winter dead of night little frankie appears in a hockey jacket with a hockey stick but i could see his fingers moving and his foot was beating to the music which was great. Does it make music? And stuff when you play it, you do the hand like this. <laughs> I just love listening to this little guy. He's so enthusiastic. I love that a little kid would, would reach out to the Lonsdale bagpiper and make him his new best friend. So yeah, I didn't expect it. And that's what I love about the moment, right? It's these things you just don't see coming. Wow, what a year it's been. Well, 135 Canadians have something to celebrate this new year. Today, they are named to the Order of Canada, one of the country's highest civilian honours. It's uh, a very nice thing to have happen at this point. CBC's Bob McEwen of the Fifth Estate was cited for his work in investigative journalism. He'll be joining the Order with playwright Thompson Highway and Olympic champion Bruni Surin. Nova Scotia's Sharon Davis Murdoch was named for her dedication to improving the lives of racialized communities. It's a beautiful thing to feel uh, recognized and supported in, in the work that one does. BC's Dr. Don McKenzie was awarded for his seminal research on exercise and breast cancer patients. And businessman Mohamed Faki of Mississauga is a well-known philanthropist. It's just amazing, you know. It's one of those moments that I will never, ever forget in my whole life. And named as companions, that's the highest level in the order, 
novelist Ian Martel for his literary and philanthropic work, and former Senator Murray Sinclair, the noted Indigenous advocate. All right, switching gears now. With extreme weather becoming the norm these days, climate change is on a lot of people's minds. We're putting in place larger sewers in order to handle the larger storm events. Coming up, what Canadians are doing to mitigate risk. I'm Jamie Poisson. Join me for CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. Every weekday, Front Burner takes you deep into the story shaping Canada and the world. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. From record heat to devastating floods, Canadians have witnessed the impacts of extreme weather this year. And as these weather events are expected to become more common, Philip Lee Shannick shows us what you can do to be better prepared. This arborist isn't tapping for sap. The nails around the base of this tree are to help diagnose its health. Once sensors are attached to the nails, the sonic tomograph uses sound waves to paint an image of what the tree looks like on the inside to expose any rot. It looks like a pretty solid tree. It's one way Canadians can prepare for more severe storms due to climate change. We are getting asked more often to do, uh, let's say, a deeper look at the risk of, of urban trees. While some do pose a risk, he says trees also help prevent soil erosion, even mudslides. Some trees absolutely should be removed. Many trees can be made smaller, they could be cabled, they could be propped. There's so many conservation techniques or management techniques. Keeping trees healthy is only one way of managing risks. Experts say each region of the country will experience climate change differently. For most people, a uh, flood uh, heat and uh, freezing rain, those are going to be some of the key impacts. So this researcher on, says some climate change preps are as easy as a trip to the hardware store. Adding some additional nails to or se securements into uh, shingles to reduce the risk that they will, will blow off during a, a tornado. If flooding is a concern, she says Canadians could install backflow valves, sump pumps and other preventative devices. Just as homeowners may want to do a risk assessment and preventative maintenance on their properties, cities across the country are preparing for climate change just on a larger scale. The City of Toronto is spending billions to upgrade wastewater and storm sewer systems. We're putting in stormwater ponds, we're putting in place holding tanks, we're putting in place larger sewers in order to handle the larger storm events. The federal government is also trying to help. Its first national adaptation strategy will be released in late 2022, mapping areas that are most at risk for floods, fires, and other extreme climate change events. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. Well, after the break, how a Facebook post led to a very special Christmas wedding ceremony. <laughs> A special Christmas for a Montreal couple. That's our moment, and it's next. This Montreal couple had their holiday wish come true, tying the knot on Christmas Day. Kelly Bedard was diagnosed with ovarian cancer last summer, and her partner Dave Lachance jumped at the chance to make it official. Thanks to the help of hospital staff and a local notary, they made the Christmas ceremony happen. And that's our moment tonight. I saw a post in the evening on a Facebook group. The poster, who I found out later was a lawyer, said that uh, she's looking for a notary to help make a Christmas miracle wedding happen. Part of the couple is terminally ill in the hospital. I started liaising with that lawyer who knew a nurse in the unit where uh, the bride is at. The three of us, we will make it happen. It really kind of like touched my heart. He's very devoted to her and he won't leave her alone. They deserve a happy ending and I'm praying. 
plein d'amour <rire> dans un petit salon de 10 par 12. Puis il y avait plein d'amour là-dedans, dans cette pièce-là, mon gars, dans cette petite 20 minutes-là. That notary rearranged her family plans on Christmas to make the special ceremony happen. Just three family members present there, but the couple actually has seven children at home, four of whom they share. Kelly, the bride, began another round of chemotherapy today. Dave spends almost every night in hospital, sometimes sleeping in his car in the hospital parking lot so he can be close with her. We're thinking of them this New Year's. That's it for us here on The National, December 29th. Have a good night.